Hello, and thank you for joining us for our webinar, The Leadership Mindset. Our presenters today are Christelle Bechtold, Corey Chasnoy, and Janine Litchfield, who are facilitators and coaches here at CPF HR Consulting. The slide deck for today's session is available on the CPF HR Consulting website. Please visit www.cpshr.us slash about slash events slash webinars to download. This session is also being recorded. We will post a link to the session on the same webinars page of our website as soon as it is available. Please be sure to check back on that web page for the recording. To ensure a high quality recording, all attendees are in listen only mode. Please be sure to stay muted to avoid interruptions to the session. If you have questions for the presenters, please enter them in the webinar Q&A panel on the right of your screen. We will address questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. And now, let's get started. We appreciate that you've taken the time today to spend some time with us to talk a little bit about leadership. There's a lot going on right now in our personal and professional lives, and so it's really a nice time to connect with one another and talk a little bit about the leadership that is so important during this particular time. Let's take a look at our agenda that we have. Well, we're gonna start off with who our presenters are. So as we talk about CPSHR's program called Leadership Mindset, um, we are going to take a look at who our instructors are for the day today. We have Corey Chasnoy, we have Crystal Bechtold, and Janine Litchfield are gonna be our instructors for this particular program for the webinar today, as well as for the Leadership Mindset Program that CPSHR is offering. So as we look at today's agenda, we're gonna take some time to talk a little bit about leadership, and we're really gonna focus on the five leadership practices from Kuzas and Posner's uh, Leadership Challenge. So we're gonna take some time to talk leadership. Secondly, we're gonna talk a little bit a bit specific, more specifically about the Leadership Mindset Program that CPSHR offers. It's a brand new leadership program that we're going to be offering. To tell you just a little bit about it in our uh, agenda this morning, we're gonna be combining both classroom and a 360 degree feedback assessment, as well as coaching and vir virtual learning labs. In this time where many of us are working virtually, um, we're really focusing on how do we blend both classroom and virtual technologies to bring you excellent leadership training. The fourth, excuse me, the fifth component of a, the leadership mindset methodology is going to be the learning agreement. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Finally, as we are looking at uh, our next training offerings, we are gonna be offering a summer discount. So we encourage that you stay on board to the end of the webinar to talk a little bit about how to get this discount for our first um, offering of the Leadership Mindset. So we'd like to go ahead and jump in and know who's on the call. We've introduced ourselves. We'd also like for, to talk a little bit about who is on the call. So if you would, please look at your chat box towards the right of your screen, and just introduce yourself. Who do we have on the call? Maybe you're an HR specialist or a manager from a department or an agency. Maybe you're a leadership development manager at a county or an organizational development consultant for a local city. Just take a minute, introduce yourself, and tell us a little bit about what you do. So we'll give you some time to go ahead and start typing in that chat box. Looks like we're getting a pretty good cross-section here of participants. Got the staff development managers, I see specialists, office manager, 
departments, agencies, fabulous, fabulous. Nice assistant directors. All right, this looks great. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. This is uh, Christelle Bechtold, so one of your facilitator and coaches for leadership mindsets. Looks like we've got a really good cross section of potential participants, uh, leaders who are decision makers within um, leadership development and training, current leaders, aspiring leaders, like a really good group. So welcome and thank you all for being here today. Um, with that, I'd love to, as uh, Janine had mentioned, um, go ahead and move into the leadership practices themselves. So feel free if you want to continue adding um, recruitment and development. Oh, this is great. Uh, continue adding in our Q&A, kind of who you are, what you represent um, in terms of leadership development. But I'll go ahead and kind of dive in in the interest of honoring the time that we have here today. So uh, again, Chris Delbeck told here, and just want to really go over a couple of the concepts here. Um, in fact, in some of the, the chats, we've seen already some questions about really what does it mean to be a leader and um, what does it mean to be a servant leader? Uh, how can I uh, have different behaviors or practices or skills to be effective in a leadership role or in my transition uh, from maybe um, analyst or first line supervisor into a leadership role? So. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about with the leadership mindset is that we're using uh, the five practices of exemplary leadership. And I just, if, if you can, just for a show of hands, if you guys are familiar with the uh, WebEx, there's a little raise hand button over on the right hand bar there. Just give us a quick raise of hand. How many of you, raise your hand if you have heard of or are somewhat familiar with uh, the five practices of exemplary leadership, or even uh, the book, The Leadership Challenge by Kuzis and Posner. Give you a moment, see if we've got some hands here. Okay, seeing some, seeing a few, nice. Awesome, all right. So again, this is not new, in fact, uh, Kuzis and Posner, uh, Jim Kuzis and Barry Posner, the authors of the book, The Leadership Challenge, um, have actually uh, been doing research on the best leaders for more than 30 years. So uh, beyond the three decades worth of uh, research and really looking at um, the best leaders in the business. These are from all kinds of different countries uh, across the world. Uh, a huge cross-section of different organizations. This is public sector, this is private industry, nonprofits, uh, local government, all kinds of uh, different businesses. And in their 30 years of research, they came up with really uh, almost simplistically, now not simple or easy, but very simplistically, these five practices uh, that they found uh, that the best leaders really demonstrate. And so those practices, as you see here on the screen, are model the way, which is basically modeling the behaviors you want to see in others. Inspiring a shared vision, which is basically crafting an idea, a vision, uh, an image of what we could be, uh, and then bringing people on board, inspiring people to jump on board and move toward uh, that future shared vision so inspiring others because we can't do it alone. As it says there, I can make a difference, but I can't do it alone. Um, so inspiring our shared vision is our second practice of exemplary leadership. The third is challenge the process. And this is really a lot about um, continuous learning and continuous improvement, trying to be better tomorrow than I was today. Uh, and then looking at the way that we interact with one another and also the way that we um, interact in our work environments uh, with policies, with procedures, and our best practices, and just making sure that those are still current and consistent and really make sense for us. So when we talk about challenging the process, it's not challenge uh, or change. It really is just looking at, does this still make sense for us? Um, the fourth practice, enabling others to act. That's basically um, providing the tools, the resources, and also the confidence and competence of those on our team, and then letting them run with it, giving them opportunity to try, test things out, 
uh, innovate um, and really take ownership of uh, their role and be able to help us move forward as a team and as an organization. And then the fifth practice of exemplary leadership is encourage the heart. And a lot of times I hear people say, oh, encourage the heart. That's all nice and warm and fuzzy and this nice little you know, warm hug. But encouraging the heart is basically really celebrations, absolutely, but it's also recognition of efforts and contribution. So it's not just a thumbs up, a good job. Encouraging the heart is connecting that good job also with here's the impact that your work has made for us. And so really making that connection, not only to celebrating um, those contributions, but really recognizing and helping others understand the part that they play really does matter and really does help us move toward uh, positive goals and end results. So with that, I wanted to dive in a little bit to each of these practices, because these are some of the questions that we get and that we will definitely um, speak through and discuss uh, throughout the leadership mindset. Uh, so as participants of the program, uh, you'll get uh, more in-depth within these five practices and then ways to be able to apply those. And we'll give you a little more information about the program itself here in just a little bit. But wanted to give you just some thoughts. Um, so first of all, again, that first practice of exemplary leadership is model the way. So I say, you know, to be clear and to lead by example is really the way that we would model. It's modeling the behaviors you want to see in others. That's walking the talk, right? Um, with that, it's uh, being clear about your personal values, ensuring that you are uh, clear in what those values are, affirming um, shared ideals with others, and uh, leading into specifically uh, our next practice in just a moment with those shared ideals, making sure that you also have alignment. So again, setting the example, knowing what your ideals, your values are, and then being able to uh, communicate those um, through your actions as well. So this is really kind of that thought of actions speak louder than words. Um, so, model the way, again, modeling the values uh, and behaviors you want to see in others. Some of these um, might look like setting a personal example of what you expect of others. Uh, maybe it is following through on promises or commitments, knowing that people can trust and rely on you for doing what you say you will do. Um, those are examples, specific, tangible behaviors of exemplary leaders within the practice of model the way. And again, we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk a lot more about this during uh, leadership mindset uh, days in the classroom and then also through uh, the uh, leadership lab sessions you'll have with your peers. But really modeling the way is looking at um, first demonstrating these behaviors. The second practice uh, of exemplary leadership is um, inspiring a shared vision. And again, that's talking about the future, that's envisioning the future, and then creating an image of what that could be. Um, it's beyond just a mental picture, but really in words and in action uh, of what we could be as a team, as an organization, and the vision, the end result that we could really create, what is possible for us if we were to model our values and demonstrate those leadership qualities um, and focus on a big, beautiful picture, as you can see here sort of in the image, is kind of that if we were to fulfill our mission uh, of our organization every day, this is the vision, the end result that we could create, so the outcomes and the impact that we could have. So inspiring a shared vision um, looks, about, looks a lot at future, um, where we're headed, being clear in that, and then enlisting others, so bringing people together and on board uh, with those specific um, steps so that we're all moving together uh, toward that common goal. It also um, is an example of um, appealing to others, uh, talking with them about how they can help uh, 
come on board. Join us in moving toward this vision, this end goal. Uh, and then also linking what their specific role might be, um, how they can make a contribution and what specific skills or strengths um, each individual person may bring to the team so that we can move forward together as an effective, high performing uh, and truly committed team. Uh, within this practice, exemplary leaders speak with genuine conviction about the higher meaning and purpose of our work. And this is something that I think um, we as uh, especially public sector individuals um, have a great opportunity every day to do. It's that, that opportunity to say, this is our mission. This is what we were brought together to do as an organization. And if we do this, here's the impact we can have uh, on the state, on the, the United States, um, within our communities, uh, and really in those areas where uh, we can have um, some sort of um, uh, a connection, um, really that, that, again, kind of purpose of why we do what we do um, each day. So painting a big picture of sort of what that future could look like, speaking with, uh, again, true sort of connection and commitment or conviction about uh, the purpose and impact of what it is that we do on a daily basis, and then appealing to others um, to really come with us, right? We can't do it alone. We need others uh, to help us move toward that common vision. So bringing people on board through um, inspiration and connection. Our third practice, uh, again, in the five practices of exemplary leadership, that third practice, uh, we call it challenge the process. So for modeling the behaviors we want to see in others, and then we're bringing people on board, inspiring that shared vision, that new vision, that new direction is going to potentially require new routes. And so as we look at this, again, the concept of sort of challenging the process, it's not challenge from the um, confrontational sort of challenge. It's more challenging the process as looking at the ways that we do things and kind of picking it apart, asking the question of, does this still make sense? Instead of saying, hey, this is the way we've always done it, so it's the way we'll continue doing it, it's stepping back and saying, does the way we've always done it still make sense for us? If it does, then that's great, let's keep doing it, right? We're looking at this process and saying, yes, this is still a best practice. And so part of that challenge, the process is just ensuring that we're moving forward Right, that we know what we're talking about um, and that we are still on the right track. Um, the specific um, practices that we're following just still have to make sense. And if we go forward and we say, hey, you know, the process we've been doing for the past, you know, 5, 10, 15 years, things have changed since then. Well, then let's relook at this. When we talk about challenging the process, we can look at what is our process? If it doesn't make sense for us, let's find better ways to do it. If you look on the screen here, commitment, uh, this is commitment number five, searching for opportunities by seizing the initiative and for looking outward for innovative ways to improve. What that means is don't reinvent the wheel. If somebody else is uh, doing something that we might be able to pattern after or even pick a few cues up from them, Let's do it, right? So looking outward is looking beyond our own program area, maybe even beyond our own department or our own organization, looking at other organizations to figure out how did they do it? What were some of the challenges they faced? What were some of their successes? Could we steal some of their successes and build from those? And can we learn from the challenges that they faced uh, and figure out ways to get around them so we don't have to go through that same path? And then that, uh, again, challenge the process, that uh, second commitment of this practice is experimenting, right? If we're going to innovate, if we're going to try to find new ways, uh, new effective ways to do our work, we've got to experiment. We've got to take risks. And with that, breaking big projects, big processes down into smaller chunks so we can generate some small wins and see the progress that we're making, celebrate that progress, and also learn from those smaller changes, those smaller experiences, what might have worked out great and what maybe didn't go right. In fact, one of the specific behaviors within this challenge the process 
um, practice is when things don't go as planned, we ask, what can we learn? Instead of going back and saying, that didn't work, who did it, who screwed up, what went wrong, it's stepping back and saying, okay, that didn't work the way we thought it would. Where did it go off track? How do we identify that next time, identify it early, and put some steps in place that will keep us on track, or at least keep us from going too far off the rails. So figuring out, again, challenge the process is all about that continuous learning or continuous improvement and figuring out how do we learn from each of our experiences each day to make us even better. So challenge in the process is actually kind of one of my favorites. Um, it's about growth, it's about development, um, it's developing confidence and competence uh, in ourselves and others, and it's really looking at our goals. We hear a lot about SMART goals, right? It's taking those goals, that vision from the second practice, and then saying, how do we get there? What road can we take? What routes do we need to continue with? Uh, and what are the areas where we might need to shift, right? And so really looking at uh, maybe taking risks and learning from uh, those experiences along the way. The best leaders are the best learners uh, and the best um, individuals to be able to kind of step out and say, how can we be even better tomorrow uh, than we were today? Uh, so with that, we come to our fourth practice of exemplary leadership. That fourth practice is enable others to act. Um, so enabling others to act, again, uh, we look at this really, uh, leaders are team coaches, and if you think about kind of the concept, as you see here, the coach can't win the game. If you think of yourself as a leader, as a coach on, let's say, a sports team, the coach can't get out on the field or get on a course, get out on the, um, uh, in the, the environment um, and, you know, pick up the ball or, you know, uh, block uh, some sort of pass. The coach can't do that. They do it from the sideline. The coach is the one that guides, that um, provides practice, uh, that gives the team members opportunities to try things. Uh, they provide skills. They provide encouragement. Uh, sometimes they provide uh, a block, right, where we say, stop, this isn't going in the right direction. Let's regroup and try it again. So if you think of yourself in a leadership uh, role as a coach, you can't get out and do it yourself. You have to get work done through others and with others. So the practice of enabling others to act is fostering collaboration. You'll see the, the two commitments. In fact, I guess I didn't explain uh, well enough in the beginning. Um, each of our five practices of exemplary, exemplary leadership have two commitments. Uh, within each. So you'll see a couple of different areas for each. So this is our, our fourth practice. So we have commitments seven and eight uh, for enabling others to act. So again, fostering collaboration, building trust, building teams, um, building those uh, relationships uh, with one another and among team members. In fact, authors uh, Jim Kuzas and Barry Posner um, use the very strong language actually for leaders. Um, that leaders must learn to mobilize others to want to struggle for shared aspirations. And it's interesting you start thinking about that. How do I mobilize people to want to struggle, for one? Um, but mobilizing people, bringing people together, getting them engaged, connected, committed, fired up um, as far as the possibilities that we have and then partnering with one another, leveraging each other's strengths, building that trust, building those relationships, and fostering that collaboration so that we can come together and do truly great um, and exemplary work. So fostering collaboration, bringing people together, building relationships, building trust, and then taking that trust and strengthening others through building confidence, building competence, and giving them opportunities to take things and run with it. Um, so if we're clear in the outcomes and the impacts we're trying to make, and we come together and talk about what does this look like for us? What are the things that we're going to need to do? What are the challenges we might face? And what are the ways we can come together to get over, under, around, through those obstacles? 
so that we can continue moving toward that very possible, very awesome vision that we created just a couple of practices ago. So really looking at, again, the behaviors within enabling others to act. This is developing cooperative relationships among the people that you work with. Um, it's seeking and not only seeking, but considering other people's input, bringing them to the table, bringing them to the conversation and bringing people into decision-making discussions, especially if they're the ones that need to implement whatever decision is made. So enabling others to act is bringing people together talking about collaborating, um, working toward a common goal, uh, and then being able to release that uh, with clear objectives, release that ownership to the team so that they can find the best way within their own abilities and their own competence uh, to be able to help us move forward as, again, a team. This is also about ensuring people grow in their jobs, learning new skills, developing themselves. But interestingly, this is also developing ourselves as leaders, not only saying, how can you grow? How can you develop? What do you need to learn? But also, what do I personally need to learn? How can I get better? How can I build my confidence and my competence uh, and strengthen myself to also be a great leader for others? So enabling others to act is really kind of that powerful action oriented as they all are uh, really that action oriented um, practice behind uh, the five practices of ignorant player leadership. And if we're strengthening others and we're building or increasing their self determination, their confidence, their learning things that brings us to our fifth practice. Uh, and that practice is encourage the heart. Um, so again, encourage the heart is talking about um, recognition, right? Recognizing contributions uh, and showing people um, that we see what they're doing, that their contributions matter, that their contributions make a difference, and that we celebrate the, the difference and the impact that people are making each day. What's interesting, uh, in fact, when we talk about um, recognition, a lot of times, and you even see here in this visual, right, it's this trophy, and we always have this thought of like everyone is, uh, you know, everybody gets a trophy. That's not what this is about. Encouraging the heart is very personal. It's very individual for each person, and it's also very collective for the team. But it's not coming together and say, hey, you get a trophy, and you get a trophy, and you get a trophy. It's being genuine. It's connecting with individuals and saying, hey, I saw what you did, and that was great. And here's the impact that it has for us. Here's the outcome that we're able to create as a result of the performance that you did, the actions that you took, the behaviors that you had in that last meeting, whatever it is, right? There's a, a line from one of my favorite leadership videos, uh, and it says, good work that gets noticed gets repeated. And to me, that is almost the epitome of this encouraging the heart. It's recognizing the contributions that people make every day. It's showing appreciation for their excellence and letting them know you saw it, you appreciate it, and to keep it up, it makes a difference. What's really interesting when we talk about also um, recognition is um, how to make recognition really matter. And there's something that we use from uh, another program. I'll actually just kind of pull it in here. It's when you recognize someone, it's recognizing not only action, but the effect that their actions have. So we call it sort of action and effect. It's not only saying good job, thumbs up, thank you, which is great. We sometimes don't even hear that enough. But it's really stepping beyond the thank you and connecting the action, what they did, what they demonstrated, and the impact that that has, the effect that that um, action has. So it could be something like, hey, I, I want to let you know I appreciate the extra time you took um, to flesh out some extra details in this research project. I could tell you took some extra time uh, and made sure that your research was accurate. Because of the time you took on this, because of the extra details um, and, and justification you provided us in this report, we're going to be able to make a more effective and um, well justified decision moving forward. Thank you for your extra work. It didn't go unnoticed. That's 
that's an example, right? We talk about action and effect. It's more than just a thumbs up, good job, thanks for the report, but it's here's what we're going to be able to do as a result of you doing your job. It matters. People need to know that their contributions matter and that they make a difference. So we talk about this encouraging the heart. It's um, specific practices or behaviors such as making a point to let people know about your confidence in their abilities. Right? It's like, you've got this and I've got your back. Right? You, you're not in this alone. I've got you. I've got, you've got my support. You can do this. Right? You've done it before. Here's all the times that you've been successful. This is just the next level. And I know you've got this and I'm right here for you. That's encouraging the heart. It's recognizing contributions, it's celebrating the victories, but also the values that people are bringing to the environment that helps us move forward uh, as an organization, as a team, um, and really as uh, kind of caring individuals. But with that, so I've been talking a lot and I apologize for that now. A couple have asked also um, if we have some questions. If you have any questions at any time, feel free to use that Q&A um, box there. I've been trying to sort of watch uh, some of the questions as they come in. But with that, we have a question for you. And so what I'd like for you to do, just thinking about the five practices of exemplary leadership, what are some ways, I'm, I'm sure as I was talking a lot, <laughs> that uh, some thoughts came to your mind of, of maybe how you demonstrate these different practices or what you've seen in your work environment. So I'd love for you guys to share, just take a moment um, and maybe in that chat box there, um, share with us what are some ways that you currently demonstrate these practices? Or maybe um, it got you thinking how you might anticipate demonstrating some of these practices in your current work environment. I'd love to see um, kind of some of your thoughts on this. So take a moment, if you'd like, in that chat box there, share some of your thoughts. How do you demonstrate these practices already? Good thoughts. Right, let my staff know I'm in it with them. Let them know I know you can do it. Right. Yeah, leading by example is really, really important. It's again one of the reasons that it's uh, for me kind of comes up as our first practice. Um, the practices of exemplary leadership is modeling the way, and we can't build trust. We can't um, ensure that we're uh, having others trust us and. Um, following our lead if we're not actually demonstrating the behaviors you want to see in them, right? So uh, sharing daily check-ins, uh, weekly one-on-ones, case reports, nice. Yeah, definitely sharing that appreciation and the uh, respect um, of this. That's really awesome. I allow myself to be vulnerable with the team and to demonstrate humility. That is huge, right? And it's interesting. I'm a, a big supporter. So uh, somebody a little bit earlier had asked a specific question about books. Um, I'm a big, big um, audio book person. One of my favorites uh, right now is Brene Brown. She's a, a vulnerability researcher, and she basically says that um, vulnerability is not weakness. It's actually um, the the most highest form of sort of courage is being able to step back and say, um, I don't know, but let me find out. Um, or you're better at this than I am. Can you take the lead on this? Um, it's stepping back and saying, hey, I think I might have said or done something that uh, wasn't right and I apologize. And here's what I'm going to do to make it right. It takes some uh, a lot of courage uh, to be able to be vulnerable that way. So um, I really love that comment of allowing yourself to be vulnerable with the team and uh, demonstrating really um, increasing their success within that. Uh, buying lunch after big projects, I love that, right? These celebrations, they're, they're not, again, uh, you know, promotions and um, about trophies. It, it's just really in showing appreciation and what's interesting, it's also 
um, with that kind of thought of coaching and um, caring. It's another uh, book that I've really been kind of looking at. Um, it's Radical Candor by Kim Scott. And she looks at this as um, caring personally and challenging directly. When she talks about being radically candid, it's having conversations for people's best interest. You have their success, their growth, their development, and their professional reputation at the heart of your conversation, and you want to bring some sort of observation to their attention because you care about them personally uh, and challenge directly. Um, I see a couple saying, I, I have tough conversations. I don't beat around the bush. I let people know when they're doing a great job and I let them know when they're getting off track. And I think that's so important. So kind of going back to that concept, right? We look at how do we demonstrate leadership behaviors? Part of it is one's having those tough conversations that say, hey, I noticed this performance. I noticed this behavior and here's the impact that it has. And I'm concerned that that might be affecting your reputation or affecting your impact. And I wanna share with you, you know, if you're willing to have a conversation, um, I wanna talk with you about how we might be able to grow from this, right? So again, Radical Candor, if you guys are looking for books, Radical Candor is fantastic. Um, that's by Kim Scott. Um, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, or uh, her concepts of um, yeah, daring greatly or courageously. Gosh, I can't remember that offhand, so I know somebody's gonna help me with that. Um, really encouraging heart uh, is a kind of that true kind of coaching behavior. Uh, yes, providing heartfelt, meaningful recognition, truly seeking collaboration, being humble enough to see where I might have some challenges and be able to grow uh, myself as well, right, definitely. Some really great comments here. Um, also know that we're looking, um, it is our plan to really grab, um, do sort of a screenshot or uh, take some of the comments that you guys are sharing here in this Q&A chat uh, and share those back with you. It may take a couple of days. Uh, this is a new format for us, um, but you guys have some really great, great uh, behaviors and practices, ways that you're really demonstrating these practices already. And we wanna be able to collect those and share those out with you. So everybody who's participating in this webinar, um, again, it might take us a few days to get there, but we definitely want to be able to share these back for you. So, um, all right, so in these Q and A, oh, you're awesome. Uh, yes, also, we'll provide some book titles and the authors we just mentioned. I'll make sure that I uh, jot those down. I have them in some notes, um, some of my favorites, but I'll um, ensure that we include those for you as well. This is perfect. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, so with that, I want to be able to kind of shift back um, a little bit and talk about really kind of how these behaviors, what they mean for us. And it's really interesting. Um, if you see here on your screen, uh, Kuzas and Posner, again, authors of the Leadership Challenge, um, have taken these five practices of exemplary leadership. And what they see, uh, the results that we see by demonstrating these practices in the work environment are actually these 10 here on, uh, on the screen you might see now. Okay. So uh, some positive workplace attitudes, and this is kind of the measure of, are we doing these things effectively? Um, are, we, um, are we really frequently demonstrating the practices of exemplary leadership? And again, as part of our program, um, and Corey's gonna kind of go into a little bit more detail of, of what this will look like, uh, but as part of our program, you'll also get uh, 360 degree assessment. It's called the Leadership Practices Inventory. And those practices are directly linked back to uh, one of the five practices of exemplary leadership. So you'll see specific behaviors, um, and those behaviors really lead to um, these impacts or these kind of positive workplace attitudes that you'll see on your screen. Things like um, uh, leaders who demonstrate uh, model the way. Um, start to bring more engagement in their work environment. And what we see really, and, and kind of the, the impact or the importance, I guess, of this um, is that studies show people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. 
And so improving the effectiveness of your leadership behaviors really leads to kind of that better working environment and some other benefits. So these here are kind of the benefits you see when you are able to really effectively and frequently, and that's really what our, um, our assessment demonstrates is the frequency at which you demonstrate these specific behaviors. Uh, but some of the benefits we've seen in the work environment, and this is through, again, three decades of uh, research uh, around these practices, but thoroughly um, and effectively applying the behaviors uh, of uh, exemplary leadership, um, it affects engagement levels. So overall, um, with these results, over 95.8% of direct reports report being highly engaged when their leaders very frequently or almost frequently demonstrate these five practices. 95.8% are highly engaged in their job just from the behaviors that their leaders are demonstrating. Um, we might see also in our work environment trust in management based on the research. 74% of direct reports agree that management is trusted when their leaders very frequently or almost always follow through on the promises and commitments they make. That's an example of modeling the way. An example of encouraging the heart with right? these behaviors around encouraging the heart and recognition. 75% of direct reports across time for 30 years, 75% of direct reports say that their trust in their leader increases when their leader makes it a point to let people know about his or her confidence in their abilities just saying, I've seen you do this. You're good at it. Here, let me give you some tips on what might make you even better. I've got confidence in you. I've got your back, right? 75% say they trust their leader when those uh, encourage the heart, when that confidence in the team member's abilities is demonstrated. We'll see in our work environment, people feel like they're making a difference. 90% of respondents agree that they're making a difference when their leaders very frequently communicate to others how their long-term interests, how I as a team member, my interests can be realized by enlisting in this common vision, by coming together, being a member of this highly productive team and helping us move forward, I know that I'm making a difference. 94% of direct reports are willing to work hard when their leaders challenge them to try out new, in, new and innovative ways to do their work. That means 94% of those who were surveyed, again, across three decades, 94% said that they're willing to work hard because they know that their leaders are challenging them to try innovative ways to do their work for the common goals, the common vision to help us move forward and be great. When I'm a part of that team, I'm highly engaged. I'm truly connected and I'm committed to doing my part to move forward so that we can realize those values. And finally, uh, enabling others to act, right? These, these uh, behaviors uh, that enable us to really do our job and, and be at our best. Uh, we talk about effective leadership. 96% of direct reports say that their leader is effective, that their leader effective when the leader almost always or very frequently develops cooperative relationships among the people that he or she works with. Leadership is about relationships. It's about the, the relationship between those who aspire to lead and those who choose to follow. And it's really interesting when we talk about leadership and those relationships, it is a choice. And with that choice, it's determining how am I going to behave what am I going to bring to the work environment? How am I going to show up each day so the people know that I'm here? I'm here for their best interest and I'm here for us moving forward as an effective team. So with that, uh, kind of some of the thoughts around these five practices of exemplary leadership and the specific sort of benefits that you might get, we know that this also leads into some challenges so with that, we have another poll question for you that we'd love to sort of get your thoughts on. And this is a multiple choice um, question. So poll question number two here, and I'll kind of kick this out. Um, what are your top challenges in training your leader? Or as a leader, what are some of the top challenges with your own learning?
Okay, that poll question is open. Uh, go ahead and enter in your answer. The poll should be showing on the right side of your screen. We'll leave this open for a few seconds to allow everyone time to go ahead and enter your answers, and then we'll share the results. Okay, looks like we've got a good number of people responding, but they're still coming in pretty well. Okay, so presenters, do you have any projections as to what you think is going to come in in the lead? I know for me, it's always forgetting curves. I learn great <laughs> stuff in the class, and then I come back to my office and go, what was that? How am I supposed to apply it? And then I default to my old behavior. Okay, I think the answers are pretty much in now, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And pull results. Oops, a couple more people still responding there. There we go. Okay, so can you see the responses there? Looks like uh, defaulting to old behaviors was at the top of the list. Um, Thanks, Julie. Yeah, definitely. Defaulting to old behaviors and kind of the, oh, there's a lot of different things here. Mm -hmm. Hey, Corey, can you help us with some ways that we might be able to uh, assist with that defaulting to old behaviors and forgetting curves? Oh, as a matter of fact, so I'm going to go ahead and talk specifically about the Leadership Mindset Program, which is the new program that we are here to launch in this summer. And uh, what's really cool about this program is it maps beautifully to the five leadership practices that Christelle just covered. And it goes into more detail about how you as leaders can be able to demonstrate these behaviors more frequently. The program's been designed different learning modalities and knowing that leaders um, is not always a one size fits all. So if we appeal to different learning styles, we'll have a much greater chance of learning being sticky than actually stick. And so the, the program includes, as Janine had mentioned in the beginning, the three days of training classes is every month. This is a, a total of a nine month program. So the training classes are a full day every other month. In between those training days, we have virtual leadership labs that will be joining um, virtually and it'll be facilitated by one of the instructors or two of the instructors. And so you can uh, attend that from the convenience of your, um, your location. You'll also have three one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions and then a pre and post leadership inventory, that 360 degree assessment that allows you to get feedback from your direct reports, your peers, your manager, and you complete it uh, for yourself. And then it really helps you calibrate your own leadership practices against the 30 behaviors, each, each practice has um, six behaviors we're looking at, so a total of 30 behaviors, and allow where you see yourself versus where others uh, see yourself in regard to your frequency of demonstrating the behaviors. Uh, so that will be done after class one, and then there'll be a post-assessment at the end of the training. So you'll have an immediate opportunity to see 
the increase in your behaviors based on your observers that others are observing your behavior. So the classes and the coaching and the leadership labs are all intended to help you make that shift in behavior from what you're currently doing and focusing on the ones that are highest leverage for you in regard to your current leadership challenges, your current environment, what's happening with you, what's happening with your team, what are your aspirations for yourself as being a leader in the future. You can see at the bottom of this slide, um, it's mapped out month by month, and it all starts out with a learning agreement that you make with your manager, where your manager will have a chance to check in with you periodically on what you're learning and how you're applying the skills to your current role. We'll go on to the next slide. Two. So as we look at the stickiness and the challenge around the forgetting curve, um, as we talked earlier, the default to the old behaviors is very much mapped to the forgetting curve. And it's natural that all of us are going to forget what we learn. Um, and transfer of learning back to the workplace is always the biggest challenge. Sometimes learning is like drinking out of a fire hose. And so when we think about the level of repetition and then getting greater levels of stickiness over time, our program, the leadership mindset is, is definitely mapped to that repetition. So repetition um, one would be the agreement that you have with your manager, repetition two would be the in-person classes, repetition three would be completing your LPI assessment and getting feedback from others, and repetition four would be coaching, and then we continue to have repetition, which is repetition uh, five, six, and seven around cohort leadership learning labs and the LPI post-program so learning happens real time as we begin to have an opportunity to hear the learning, talk about, reflect on it, do some hands-on application, understanding what's working and what's not, and then self-correcting along the way. Ultimately, practice habits. And so building those habits and building that muscle memory over time is really that consistent application over time. Let's go to our poll number three. How much are you currently spending on leadership development? So if you are either um, someone in charge of it, uh, the, the options here for the poll are not enough time, uh, too much, uh, not enough money, too much time. It's not about the time, it's about the application or other. And then if you could use your chat box to complete, if there's a write in answer that you have that doesn't cover one of these other uh, five options. So when we're talking about our investment in leadership development, it's really about the time and the money and how much we believe that that investment's gonna pay off for us. So I'll give you a moment to load in your answer. Okay, and so that poll is open. Again, the poll panel is on the right side of your screen. Go ahead and enter in your answers. And we'll give this maybe another 30 seconds to let folks get their answers in. And then we'll see what we're looking at. Okay, mm, I see a couple of them running neck and neck, not to spoil anything for you. And let's give you a few more seconds to, to finish entering in your answers. And two of them are almost identical in answers. <laughs> Um, okay. which one? Oh, let's see. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> it's only for another couple of seconds. We'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Oops. 
actually WebEx wants us to give it another 13 seconds. So. Okay, there we go. Let's share the poll results. And looks like not enough time was um, just spot on equal with it's not about time with money. <laughs> and then second after that was not enough money. And those were um, the bulk of the answers. So back to the presentation. Thank you. Okay, Appreciate thanks. the answers. And as we're looking at not enough time, uh, the challenges there are how do we look at the return on investment ultimately? So as we look at time and costs, um, Quite often, many leadership programs that have this level of rigor around it will cost anywhere between 35 to 3,500 to 4,500. And as we're looking at the unique impact, quite often when we invest money into a program, we're trying to what's the ultimate impact to our organization and to me as a leader. If your average leader having anywhere from five and direct reports and the work that they're doing and trying to manage and maximize and optimize those the performance of those individuals, um, the investment of the company becomes really critical to make sure that they're ultimately getting the best leadership, um, best skills available. So coaching combined with training is actually the standard leadership development um, versus simply sending someone to a class. You can get some level of impact and some nuggets that come away and can be applied to the job, but ultimately you want to be able to maximize that investment over time. And investing in employee development ultimately leads to a higher impact around employee engagement where employees feel valued that they are being invested in their development for them best version of, their, of, of themselves. Let's go ahead and move on. I want it, I'm watching the clock here and I know we've got a couple of minutes and I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, ultimately looking at enrollment for this program of open enrollment or intact teams. Uh, we're offering the program for both intact teams. Intact teams are typically folks that are coming from the same organization um, that may um, may want to come together and learn to create kind of a team building as well. Quite often when we own development, we want to attend uh, somewhat anonymously so we can try out new behaviors, have conversations about some of the challenges we have back at work where it's confidential. So think about you know, your own participation and how you might want to attend uh, through an open enrollment process or an intact team. We'll go on to the next like specifically around our summer spec. So as we talked about the cost of these programs typically being, um, you know, higher in the three to $4,000 range, uh, we are looking at the pricing for this uh, typically of being $2,900 per participant. Um, and for our summer special, we're, actually, we're offering a 15% discount, which will be offered at 24.65 per participant or a $435 savings. And so as we look at this for the participants that are on the call today, the summer special is being offered to you and to your organization. We'll go to the next slide, which is the class schedule and a copy of this, these um, slides. So you can look at the schedule on your own. Uh, the important thing to, to note is it starts June 16th uh, for this open enrollment class. And then for intact teams for your organization, we can schedule that at your convenience and possibly at your location if that's more convenient. But you can see how this schedule is uh, spread out over time to maximize the impact. We are at the top of the hour. 
Um, Christelle, would you like to um, take a look at any final question? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it looks like uh, as some of the questions coming through, we were able to either answer them or you just answered them uh, specifically for us. Um, we did have a couple questions. Are we able to see some of the responses that were provided? Yes, absolutely. It's our intention to send those out again to everybody who has joined our webinar or registered for the webinar. It may take a couple of days for that, but uh, we'll send those out to you. Also, there was a question of some of the books and resources that we've mentioned. I will uh, gather those for you and a few additional, and we'll make sure those are sent out to you as well. I think as I'm scrolling through, that's really uh, the bulk of uh, some of the questions, again, they were related towards uh, the leadership practices, um, how we're able to demonstrate those. And so we will, again, get your responses that you noted in our chat there. Uh, we'll share those out with you so you can start uh, practicing some of these as well. Um, but with that, that is the end of our time. Okay. Well, yes, we are at time now, and I want to thank you, Christelle, Corey, and Janine for this really great information, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, be sure to check our website at cpshr.us slash about slash events slash webinars for the recording, and we will be sure to send out a summary of the, the chat and the ideas that were shared in today's webinar. So with that, I wish you all a very good day and thank you very much. Bye. Bye.